give everyone one, one more minute until one o'clock. There we go, it's one o'clock on the dot. <laughs> Welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, Literacy is Opportunity. My name is Lauren Brenner and I'm on the literacy team here at Amplify. We are so excited to have you with us today as we hear from educators about building an impactful biliteracy education program. Before we get started, I just wanted to share a little, a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be recorded and we'll email out the recording link for you to rewatch as you'd like. And everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance via email. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll, and we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. Additionally, we also welcome any comments in the chat. And to start, let's find out where everyone is joining us from today and what your role in education is. I'm joining us, I'm joining everyone from outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania today. Let's see. New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, another Pennsylvania, Lancaster, not too far, Oklahoma, Canada, another Pennsylvania, Florida, let's see, MTSS resource teacher. New York, Nebraska, Maryland. Seems like we're all over the board, all over the country and even outside of the country. Dual language classroom, Spanish zone, instructional coach. Well, welcome. We're so excited to have everyone here today. So from all over the country, all over the world and all different titles. And just a quick note too, that we have even more webinars scheduled for this series. So if you haven't already signed up for more, please do. Next week, we are hosting another panel of educators to share about their experiences using the Amplify by Literacy Suite. And we've also got sessions about supporting students with dyslexia and the importance of language screening in the coming weeks. To find out about the other webinars in this series and watch recordings of the past webinars, visit amplify.com backslash literacy dash is dash opportunity dash series. And we'll also drop that link in the chat box that you can easily click it, click it and save it and register for um, upcoming webinars. So thank you again for joining us today. We are so excited to have my colleague Kajal Patel below with us today. Kajal is the VP of Biliteracy at Amplify and we and will be hosting our panel discussion today about starting a biliteracy education program. On our panel today, we are so lucky to have with us Esther Bella, the bilingual and SLAR coordinator at Garland ISD in Texas. Betty Moreno Paz, the director of multilingual department and at Cicero School District 99 in Illinois, and Liliana Kendrick, a bilingual early, early literacy specialist from Round Rock ISD in Texas. Welcome everyone. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Kajal. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, welcome to our attendees and to our roundtable panelists. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us for this important conversation. English learners are a fast growing portion of our student population, 15% and growing of our K-3 students. And in 2019, according to NAEP data, 10% of, of English learners were proficient readers compared with 39% of, of non-English learner students. So of course, both of these numbers need to improve, but the gap really has to be addressed as a matter of equity. And we know that bilingualism is an asset and a cognitive strength and students that have this gift should have the opportunity for better outcomes. Um, as educators, you know this, and to drive positive long-term outcomes, we have to honor the home language, culture, and community experiences of the students. And research tells us that continued development of students' home language supports literacy development in the language of instruction because literacy in a second language builds from the first. So we have an urgent need. We at Amplify are committing ourselves to bringing solutions uh, to teachers and students. And that requires learning. And so today we're going to learn together from experts and leaders in the field so that we can drive the path forward. So welcome again to our panelists who are joining us from Illinois and Texas. We're so excited to learn from you and the diverse perspectives and experiences that you bring from your parts of the country and in your districts, um, all with that shared passion for literacy and biliteracy and equity for the kids um, in your communities. So our focus today is that, you know, biliteracy can unlock untold opportunities for students. And so how can we start building an impactful biliteracy education program? Um, it, how, how can you do that in your schools and districts? And so we're thrilled and fortunate to invite this, to welcome this panel that 
has this experience, has deep experience in this journey, and that are and they're going to share um, with us about their journey, the supports and practices that were critical, the role of research-based biliteracy curriculum, and everything they learned along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. Um, and meanwhile, in the chat, I you know invite you throughout, please, to share with us where where you are in your biliteracy journey, and and what you would like to learn more about. Um, first, Esther Bella, she has spent 17 years in bilingual education, working for three North Texas districts, two years in pre-K, eight years in elementary as a bilingual teacher, and four years as an assistant principal. She's in her third year as the Spanish language arts coordinator in Garland ISD in Texas, where she oversees the dual language curriculum for pre-K to six. She has a bachelor's in business management from University of Maryland Global Campus and a master's in education in educational leadership from Dallas Baptist University. She's passionate about equity in education and for providing high quality materials for our Spanish speaking students. We also welcome Liliana Kendrick, another leader in bilingual education, curriculum writing and project based instruction. She has an undergraduate degree from Texas State University in computer science and a graduate degree from Concordia University in education administration. She's driven by a passion for supporting and empowering children of all ages and educators who serve them. She has 16 years developing her expertise to design and provide engaging high quality curriculum instruction to educational organizations across Central Texas. And with her multilingual background and knowledge, she strives to create diverse and equitable learning experiences for children. And finally, Betty Moreno Paz. She has her undergraduate degree in elementary education from Northeastern Illinois University, a master's in curriculum and instruction, and a second master's in school leadership from Concordia. She's currently pursuing her PhD in educational leadership with superintendent endorsement at Concordia. She's been in education at Cicero District 99 in Illinois for 18 years, 13 years as a bilingual teacher, two as an administrator, and then the last three as director of multilingual services. So we have a wealth of experience here at our roundtable, a lot to learn. Probably we need a whole day or three days or a retreat to learn everything that they know about all their experience. We're going to do our best um, in this hour. Um, first, I want to just take a look at what some of the um, some of you all are saying about your biliteracy journey and what you would like to learn. Um, and so I'm taking a look at the chat and, you know, we'll come back to that to make sure um, that we are uh, hitting on, on some of your questions. I'm going to kick it off with our first question for our panel. Um, so first, I, we would love to just you know, to hear from you and for you to introduce your schools, your communities, who are the students that you are serving? What are the demographics in terms of size? What are the skills and assets that you're bringing, uh, that the students are bringing? Um, and so let's kick it off with Liliana. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Liliana Kendrick, and I serve as a bilingual early literacy specialist in Round Rock ISD. Round Rock ISD, it is north of Austin, Texas, and we currently serve an approximately 47,000 students. We have 54 schools out of those 35 are elementary. And those uh, 35 elementaries, we have 12 that are bilingual campuses. Within our 12 bilingual campuses, we serve uh, different levels of students and also part of our population of, we also very multilingual and we serve a lot of different um, population of students, including 20% of them are Asians, 36% are Hispanics and 37% are whites. So we have a range of diversity in our district. Uh, we currently have a 90-10 model on our, our school system as a dual language, and we also have one-way and two-way campuses. Thank you. Esther. Hi, everyone. I'm Esther Bella. I am with Farland ISD. We are just outside of Dallas, Texas, and we serve 55,000 students um, in 71 campuses. Our students speak 69 different languages, and our emergent bilinguals make up 34% of our population, which is about 19,000 students. We are unique in that we serve three different communities, three different cities, and so we have a culturally and linguistically and economically diverse population. 
And uh, our dual language program is offered in 41 of our elementary campuses. And then we have um, one of our middle schools that just started a dual language program. And then we also have one campus that offers a dual language Vietnamese program. Wow, that is and this, so much language diversity. Um, Betty. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, well, in within our school district, we are right outside of Chicago. So we have about 15 schools. Um, we have a pre-K to third building. We have four to sixth grade middle school. And then we also have just one school building that houses all of our seventh and eighth graders. Um, our population of students is about 9,500 students, um, which 56% of our students population are classified as English learners. In addition to that, 98% of our population are Hispanic students, so dominant in Spanish. And um, we do have the majority of our students coming from either emergent bilingual homes or simultaneous bilinguals. So we do have one-way and two-way models within our school district. Thank you. And so we've heard uh, you, the three of you mentioned one way, two way, 90, 10. So I'd love to kind of talk a little bit more about, about those models, what they are, how you got there. Um, there's many bilingual instructional models in place and in, in, in places in the journey where schools might be. So um, would love to hear a little bit more about the ones that you have in place and how they actually operate in practice in the school day in terms of the, the time allocation, the subjects, and, and what that means for your curriculum approach. Um, we can start with uh, Esther. All right, so the most common models are the transitional model and the dual language model. The transitional model has an early exit option or a late exit option, usually second grade or fifth grade. And the goal of that model is to support our students while they transition to English as quickly as possible. The second type of model are the dual language models, and those focus on building language so that students are biliterate and equally strong in both languages when they exit the program. And typically these will go all the way through elementary school. In the one-way model, the native Spanish speakers learn both Spanish and English. In the two-way model, your native Spanish speakers and native English speakers are evenly combined in the same classroom, and then they learn both English and Spanish. So in Garland, we have 40 campuses with a one-way dual language model where they're learning Spanish and English, and then one campus with a two-way dual language model. And then that, as I was saying before, that one campus with a one-way dual language model in Vietnamese. And so our district had to develop its own unique bilingual framework. And so what it looks like here is that kinder and first students learn math and English, and then all the other subjects in Spanish and they do the same thing every day. In second through fifth grade, our Spanish language arts and social studies are taught three days in Spanish, two days in English, science is always taught in Spanish, and math is always taught in English. And so right now we're currently using the Amplify curriculum, and in order to meet the needs of our bilingual students, we've had to develop our own scope and sequence where we take um, some from the English curriculum, some from the Spanish curriculum, and make sure that we are hitting all the TEKS or the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills and making sure that we're introducing new concepts on Spanish days, spiraling on English days, and then also trying to be as structured as we possibly can when we're introducing those foundational skills so that our students are getting everything they need. Thank you, Betty. So in, uh, in our previous years, we did only have the transitional model within our district. About four years ago, because we wanted to make sure that we valued uh, students' home language and we view our students as an asset, in order for us to continue to do that, we did move to a dual language program within our district. And so our program began about four years ago with an 80-20 model um, with integrated units. This year, uh, with the support of Amplify, we piloted uh, Amplify with a 50-50 model within our district. It was a huge success within our district. And so um, after we did a little bit of a survey for our staff, um, we are moving forward next year with a 50-50 model. And that is also taking into account our simultaneous bilinguals. So taking that into consideration within our district, we have K to five who are currently dual one way, 
And then in six of our buildings, we have the two-way model. So we want to ensure that our simultaneous bilingual students and our monolingual English students are also building that biliteracy. So our model will actually shift next year. So our instructional minutes currently look a little bit different. And we're working through that to now um, build a program where we are doing a 50-50 model. But currently within our 80-20, um, we provide 80-20 at kindergarten and then move towards 70-30 and then by third grade, it's a 50-50 model. So our 80-20 uh, model math and all other content areas are in Spanish. And so um, it, in, in the fact that we wanted to ensure that we support our simultaneous bilingual and after the pilot program with Amplify, um, we're moving forward with the 50-50 model. So we're still working through those instructional minutes to make sure that we have a good start to the school year for next year. Thank you, um, Liliana. Yes, our model right now, we, we have the model, which is the 90-10 model, which is start, we start in pre-K, where it's 90-10, and then kinder goes 80-20, and then it goes so forth when we get to third, fourth, and fifth, we're 50-50. Uh, we have had different models previously. We used to have the 50-50, but we currently have the 90-10 in the last about six years. Uh, our model also have to create a framework to support our needs and one of the big needs that we're using right now is we're looking into amplify curriculum to make sure that we're meeting the uh, the continent language allocation plan and figure it out what languages are going to be taught or what content is going to be taught in what language so that we make sure that our minutes are complying what we need to do and make sure that we offer true bilingual and biliteracy students. Um, at the same time, we also want, uh, because of our minutes, we only have a number of minutes a day, right? So we have to be very creative on how we plan and how curriculum it's planned on our districts to support our students. So one of the things right now we're currently doing is we're on the project of redesigning our curriculum with our minutes and making sure that sometimes for a part of the English language arts or the ELD for the lower grades, we are including and integrating our content areas to make sure that we are feeding all the content areas to provide the best support for our students. And that having said, it, it takes some thinking, some process and some takeaway and keep going back and forth by different grade levels to meet the support of our students. So would love to dig into some of those challenges and solutions because all three of you talked about um, adaptations that you've had to make to what you have to fit your models. And you've also all talked about moving you know, ch changing your models over time to better meet the needs of your students. And so um, in thinking about those things, what are what are some specific challenges that you have um, encountered and what are the solutions that you have found work um, for your teachers and students? So let's start with with Betty. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we did within our district was we had a dual language committee in which our teachers um, developed integrated units um, to ensure that we were able to provide content in uh, the language. So some of the challenges that came across were, um, it was difficult to keep up. We needed to make sure that uh, the teachers were vested and uh, creating units, it's very time consuming. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of within district time. And so when we came across those challenges, um, we realized that we needed to make sure that we provided a resource for our teachers. And then we were able then to supplement some of that, uh, some of the things that we believe were, um, that were needed, so, such as cross-linguistic connections, making sure that we had opportunities within our research to build our students' biliteracy. In addition to that, like, you know, the bridge, I think those are one of the key components that we need to make sure that our students are able then to see uh, how things transfer to the other language, because in order to build that biliteracy, students need to see it in both languages, and they need to have that metalinguistic awareness. So some of those resources that we needed were not available. So some those were some of the challenges that we encountered, but um, we have a literacy committee now that's supporting some of that. And we're building those resources so that teachers have that within their, their tools. And um, I think that 
making sure that you express the why we're moving towards is really important because what you want is for teachers to be on board. You want them to believe that this is what's best for our students. So I think starting off, if you are one of the, the districts that are just starting a program, I think you need to make sure that you are addressing the why so that there's more teachers that are on board and are able to support your mission and vision. Thank you. Yes, that was really helpful. Um, and so important, the why, just understanding, because um, change is hard. And that's, yeah, what, what's motivating is the why. Liliana. I think just piggyback what Betty says, I think that it's very important and for our challenges has been also the integration piece, right? And making sure that we are allocating the support. And so we're constantly trying to bring experts on the field, bringing our instructional coaches, our curriculum coordinators to be in pace, our directors on the program, as well as just our district. As stakeholders, one of the biggest things is we have to educate our administrators, right? So that they can understand and see like, Betty was saying the vision and the mission of where our program is and how can we support better our students. I'll, another thing that we can find very challenging is the resources, right? Like we want to make sure that we provide authentic literacy. We also want to have bilingual books and also books that are being translated and then also be the equity piece, right? Like how it's cultural relevant and it's equitable so that our students see themselves on the curriculum. It is just, we cannot have a, a curriculum that is a translation or an ELR, right? Like we're always looking what is authentic, what does it look like and how can we integrate it so that our students can see themselves in that curriculum. So that uh, is a challenge because the resources are not always provided. They're not always there, especially when it comes to differentiation. Like what are resources are there? One of the biggest challenges is that assessments, how the assessments protocol look like. Are we having enough programs or resources to differentiate our students? Not only are well below and below students, but how we do from above and way above students, like how we reach all our kiddos, especially if you are in a two-way program. And how do we do that? So those have been some of the questions that we continue to have in our district having those uh, literacy committees with our stakeholders from all levels, all the way from leadership, all the way from our teachers and continue to have focus groups and continually revising and, and, and continue to study how can we better serve our district. So we're constantly in a communication and trying to better do that. Thank you for sharing that. I, the themes of differentiation and making sure that students can see themselves in the curriculum are, are so important and is really important, I think, for us to continue to hear um, as, as we listen to, to those that we are serving. Um, Esther. I just want to say ditto to everything that's been said so far. Um, and definitely for us, you know, one of the challenges we've had is identifying that model that fits our district needs. We did change from transitional to dual language in the past few years, and that transition was a growth process. We started with, uh, we divided our campuses into three cohorts, and then we started with one cohort at a time, and a couple of grade levels, kindergarten first, first, and then each year we added one grade until we made it all the way uh, to dual language on all our campuses. Another uh, challenge that we face is implementing a bilingual program with Fidelity. Fidelity is huge. I see you ladies nodding with me. Um, just getting everybody on board and following the same things all the way across because we know what works and just getting everybody um, excited about doing that, that why, going back to that why. Um, another challenge for us has been developing the scope and sequence in the curriculum, making sure that we are um, able to incorporate all the pieces so that our students have what they need. And then, um, as uh, Viviana was just saying, um, getting the resources in Spanish. There's so much out there in English, and we've really worked hard in our district to make sure that there's equity in all the materials that are available to our bilingual teachers. So whatever exists in English, whether it's a video, a book, a resource, if we provide that in the English curriculum, we are providing it in the Spanish curriculum. And sometimes that means we have to make it. Sometimes that means it's available and it's out there. Um, another challenge is that sometimes there will be resources that are available in Spanish in K2, but not in 3.5. And so we need to have things that go all the way through K-5. Some of the solutions that we've come up with is we have a multilingual programs department, and this is a team that is dedicated to implementing the dual language model. And 
uh, they support teachers with the with the dual language program and how to implement that with fidelity and they support the bilingual curriculum and then we have a dual language curriculum team that is in charge of writing the curriculum and then also supporting teachers and implementing that and these two departments work very closely together with their bilingual teachers to provide them with layers of support to help them be successful we provide lots of trainings in dual language and sheltered instruction and we just try to listen to our teachers, give them a way to give feedback so that we are constantly growing and um, listening to them and giving them what they're asking for. Thank you. I, I, shifting gears a little bit, you know, in thinking about the, the, the families and the community, how are you engaging parents and the community? What has been, what has been the response? Um, and an involvement from them. Uh, we'll start with Liliana. Uh, our district, uh, we have a department that's called State and Federal, and our department has a department exclusively for supporting parents and one of our, our bilingual campuses and Title I campuses as well, not necessarily bilingual, but Title I campuses. We have a parent Liam's, which is a person that it is in charge to make that connections and support our parents when they get here and providing all kinds of support. Not only we provide them support or how they can support the child at school, but we also how they can support them at home with books and resources, how to access resources within our district and our community. We also provide support with our families, like some of them are um, no English speakers. So we provide ESL classes, like we teach them English, and we offer that as support. And we also want to make sure that we offer what is called literacy and math nights, so instructional nights to our parents so that they can come and see and be able to how we partner school and parents to support their students. So it is a very important component. We're constantly communicating. We want to make sure that uh, our all communication goes out in both languages and Spanish and English for most of our community. And then we are even making sure that even for our community, there are Asians. We're trying to provide it at least in their top five languages that they're more spoken in our district as well in that. And so making sure that we are addressing our community and multilingual community, it is so important and always making it a priority rather than a second thought, but it's always there to, to ensure the support with our parents. Thank you. Esther. So um, as I said, we serve three different cities and they have varying levels of involvement and affluence and disadvantage depending on the community. And so we try to be very broad in the support that we provide. We have a family and community engagement department um, who helps to, to support the community. Uh, they offer an evening study center. We provide classes in ESL and citizenship, the GED, computer classes, and even college 101. Um, we also provide parents with different opportunities throughout the year to attend conferences that help them, um, whether it's in parenting or helping their child with school um, and with their learning. And we really try to help our parents understand their role as supporter, monitor, and advocate of their students' needs and give them a voice so that they can advocate for their students. Uh, our classes uh, provide daycare, they're offered at flexible hours, and um, interpretation is provided if that's needed. And then uh, we have an interpretation department that helps across the district, as well as um, people on every campus that speak Spanish and English. Um, and then uh, we also have language lines so that if a teacher is trying to have a conference with a parent and they don't speak the language, they can schedule a call with the language line so that it doesn't matter what language it is, someone can talk to them in that language. And that's been very helpful. Our communications always go out in three languages, Spanish, English, and Vietnamese. And we also have a dual language parent advisory committee who um, is very active and has a voice in, in representing our communities that are um, just dual language speaking. Thank you. And Betty? Um, well, within our district, we do have a parent liaison who leads many of our parent workshops. Um, we are partnered with her in regards to making sure that our parent leaders are aware of our programming models as well, because they are the advocates for uh, our students and parents within each one of the buildings. Um, our building administrators offer monthly parent coffees, and it is based on the interests of parents. In addition to that, we have dual language parent forums that we offer three times a year. 
Um, we do have a parent university night where we have uh, a speaker that comes in and then we have uh, smaller workshops that are happening. We usually have about 10 to 15 different workshops that uh, we have at parent university. Um, in addition to that, we offer district wide parent workshops that are based only on dual language. So we just recently had one last week on uh, how to support our dual language students, like building a language, a dual language environment at home. Um, we also partner with our high school on the seal of biliteracy. So any students that are currently in our program, parents see like their bilingual trajectory. And then once they reach high school, then they'll be able to see, you know, what does that look like towards the seal of bi-literacy. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we do partner with a translation company. So any of our workshops that we offer within district, if parents other than Spanish have another language, uh, we do partner with them. And so they're able either to come in or phone in, or we use a translation device as well. Um, so we try to offer as much as possible to our parents because um, we do believe that our parents are our advocates for our students. And without that partnership, then, you know, it relies mostly on teachers in our district, but we need to build that partnership with our parents. Thank you. Um, so all three of you have mentioned language diversity besides Spanish, right? Um, Esther, you said, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but maybe 68 different languages. Um, including a Vietnamese dual language program. Um, Liliana, you talked about the, the I think, 30%-ish of the Asian population, and that that is multiple languages, and you're trying to make sure that you serve the top five languages. And Betty, you talked about other languages as well. Um, you know, and and while you all three also talked about how there, there still needs to be an, um, it is a journey that more resources in Spanish to provide that equity, there, we get a lot of questions about the other languages where there is far less in terms of resources. Um, and so I, I, mean, I would love to hear you share uh, with, with, our, with, our, um, with our audience how you've addressed that type, all your language diversity in terms of instruction and assessment and, and how you're serving the students. And I even see in the chat that um, this has come up in the chat. Um, and a couple of resources have been shared in the chat as well. Um, so thank you for sharing those. I think Deanne is the one that asked that question. Where do you find resources in other languages than Spanish? Um, and then a couple of answers from, from Brandy and, and Martin. Um, so I'll start with Esther, since um, I would love to hear more about this Vietnamese dual language program, um, as well as all the other stuff you're doing. All right. Well, uh, yes, 69 different languages. You were right there. You were so close. Um, <laughs> uh, so we do have the Vietnamese program at one campus, and we started it the same, starting with kinder, then first, then second. And so um, we have writers that are teachers that help develop the curriculum for that. And so it's a work in progress, and we're excited to be able to offer that. Uh, for other students um, that that make up 34% of our population, uh, we have made sure that all our core content teachers are ESL certified. So everybody elementary, secondary that teaches core content um, has passed that EL certification. Um, we as a district are passionate about sheltered instruction. We have a sheltered instruction department that's part of the multilingual programs department, um, a sheltered instruction team that just goes out at the secondary level, at the elementary level and is supporting that um, that instruction being incorporated into the instruction that students do. We also approach it from the curriculum side, helping teachers to know how to apply sheltered instruction to the Amplify curriculum um, and what that looks like specifically in practice time so that they can practice incorporating that in. Um, we have a newcomer program for middle school and high school students where they come in um, and kind of get their feet under them before they go into the regular classrooms and campuses. Uh, when they arrive, when the newcomers arrive, they receive a newcomer support plan and access to the, newco the newcomer team. And this includes a newcomer curriculum, a summer school, and then after school virtual tutorials. And then going back to our bilingual students who speak Spanish, uh, we started a sixth grade dual language program this year. And our goal is for our bilingual students to continue in that dual language program through eighth grade. We're working our way there so that when they finish in eighth grade, they will have met all the requirements to receive the seal of biliteracy on their diploma when they graduate in high school. 
Um, and then we are headed towards a CTC program in high school for our students where they will be able to get um, certified as a court interpreter or where they will be uh, able to get certified as a Spanish um, medical transcriptionist. So we are hoping to offer that in the future and just kind of extend that all the way so that, because um, we don't want them to lose it at the end of elementary. We want them to continue. We want them to be proud of that language and we want it to carry forward so that they can do something with it and really benefit from being dual language speakers in the future. Wow. It just hearing that makes me so excited for the kids and their future. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, Betty. Um, just like uh, Esther mentioned, we are striving towards having all of our staff be ESL certified. We are providing cohorts and partnering with the university this year. Um, so we do have about 12 teachers that are currently going through an ESL cohort, which we're very excited about. Um, but in addition to that, we do also have paraprofessionals that support within our buildings. Um, so in the event that we need additional supports, uh, we do have paraprofessionals that are Spanish speakers so that they can support in the classroom, in our English classrooms. Um, we have also ESL leads at every building. So one ESL lead is assigned at every building and the ESL lead supports the building by providing monthly professional development on um, ESL strategies, differentiation. In addition to that, we also have a district ESL lead who then provides all the professional development to our ESL leads um, on a monthly basis. So we try to ensure that uh, we are providing as much support for our teachers, um, especially with such a large influx of newcomers this year. We uh, incorporated and started a newcomers program after school, um, which has been very successful. I mean, we have, uh, we did a mid-year check-in with our teachers who are running the program and our students are making great success and um, they're excited. We saw a couple of videos of our teachers recording our after-school program. And it's very exciting to see that our students uh, are, you know, are on that trajectory of becoming emergent bilinguals. So, um, so we try to look at what we currently have in place and then just strengthening based on our needs. Mm -hmm. Liliana. Well, I just echo what Esther and Betty said. And one of the things that we do here in Run Rock is we have an emergent bilingual uh, coaches specialist where they go over and they support campuses with all our bilinguals. Like I said, we have about 22% of our population it's uh, Asian from all, you know from all over and we have multiple languages so we want to make sure that they support at the elementary middle school and high school right we also have a new commerce uh, school where our students go in there but we also want to make sure that at the curriculum level we are making sure that we are making those adaptations as we were writing it and include it on the Alps make sure that every structure and every shelter instruction and opportunities and strategies to support multilingual learners learners are embedded on our curriculum. Uh, we also want to provide support for our families and, and, and parents, right? So it is so important that we address, we want to make sure that uh, one of the biggest things that we want to know is that every culture is value, right? And every culture brings so much into our community and into our curriculum, right? So what our languages from all over the country brings and everything, we, it's so important that we value it and we look at it as an asset versus something like a challenge. It is a challenge to serve, but we also have to keep changing our, our mind shift that it is a value and praising and, and supporting, especially our, we have an Asian Vietnamese community. We do not offer the program, but we are probably have the numbers close enough to offer it. So the more that we open ourselves to the topic and search for resources that allow us to do that, we will better serve our community. Thank you. One thing that I heard as a common thread between what all three of you were saying is the um, the the support of the teachers in in various ways, right? And so through Liliana, you talked about the coaches, um, and Esther and Betty, you talked about the ESL certification for the teachers. And so I would love to hear professional development is so important and. One of the challenges that you are always faced with is is time and money. <laughs> 
Um, so I would love, I think people would love to hear how do you make this happen with the limited resources that we're always faced with in education? I'll start with Betty. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we are very limited, um, but I do have to say that it is, um, it starts at the district level and making sure that your district stakeholders are on board and that they're supporting the process. Um, it's, it's every year, it's a school improvement, right? We make sure that whatever we have currently in place, we see some of the gaps that we have and then we bring everyone on board. I think that's one key component that if we all are able to see the gaps and then we see that where professional development is needed, then we provide those opportunities. And one of the key components, it's not only during our in-service days, but also after school. We do have opportunities for our teachers to attend specific professional development after school. They, it is paid time. We do use title funds for that. Um, do we have everyone that attends? Of course not, but um, we do have a large portion of our teachers who do attend after school, pro, our after school professional development. In addition to that, we have several after school committees. And this year, what we also um, what, what we also provided are virtual sessions, so teachers have an opportunity to go home and actually attend professional development, um, like from five to six. Um, we've also had a, a couple of book study groups that have been very successful. I definitely encourage any school district um, to incorporate book study groups. Our teachers are always looking to see what's the latest research and learn more instructional practices to incorporate it within, within their instruction. Um, and I mean, there are so many things that you can incorporate within uh, your current uh, day but I think most effective has been our after school opportunities, whether it's committee, uh, book study groups, mm -hmm. or just virtual sessions that you're able to provide um, at the comfort of the teacher's home has been very successful. Great, okay. So meeting the, the, the convenience is really important, right? Um, Liliana. I think one of the important things is make sure that we are providing, like she said, professional development, exactly in shelter instruction. That's uh, also we offered, uh, the district offers and support teachers on becoming uh, ESL certified. We, we offered and we try to have all of them, but it's always a challenge now these days to make sure that we have bilingual certified teachers as well ESL certified. So one of the things we have done as a district is providing funding and support and also helping them to train so that they can get certified. The other pieces we wanna make sure that we are, it's embedding uh, coaching, like we talk about, we have emerging bilingual coaching. You wanted that coaching on demand, right? Like you just want the teachers to be able to have feedback as they're teaching. And so being able to support that and bring them with the strategies, we also do power verse throughout the after school sessions, like 30 minutes to 45 minute sessions of professional development after the school to provide those very targeted instructions at the end or at the beginning of the units before the units start. So the teachers kind of have a bank of tools so that they can support and rely while the teacher well, they teaching and supporting their students. Uh, we also create uh, different meetings on PLCs uh, on our campuses where we support especially those uh, ESL campuses that have a whole lot of students and try to constantly bring in how can we support with materials and resources. You say money it is, we use our Title I campus to support that and we use our state and federal to make sure that how can we support our campuses the best we can with our resources. Got it. So flexibility, variety, small chunks is, are definitely things I'm hearing for, from both of you. Um, Esther. So we are very grateful to have a um, Spanish language arts curriculum team. So in addition to myself, we have three instructional design facilitators who help support our campuses in Spanish. Um, we also have an ELST or early literacy support teacher model, um, which is a coach that is on every campus to support in kindergarten through third grade. And while they are not all Spanish speaking, what's really important that we uh, try to communicate is that good instruction is the same, whether it's offered in English or Spanish. 
And so making sure that our teachers are providing that quality instruction, whether it's in English or in Spanish, um, the coaches are there able to help them one on one meet with them in PLCs, able to look at that. And when they need more support, they reach out to the IDFs, um, my instructional design facilitators, and we can come and provide that support in Spanish. For fourth and fifth grade, we have instructional support teachers or curriculum support teachers um, that are the coaches that help in the higher grades. Um, and then we also have a curriculum feedback committee and teachers are able to come back and meet with us once a month and say, hey, this worked, this didn't work. We have a curriculum writing team that helps adapt what we've done, previously review it for the past um, units and go back and look and say, hey, here's what we need to tweak, here's what we need to add. And uh, we're just kind of, kind of constantly looking at it through a growth mindset of how can we make it better. Um, it is hard to find that time. We have tried different things. Uh, we have tried offering office hours where bilingual teachers could jump in on a Google Meet and ask whatever questions they had. Um, we started that uh, during COVID. <laughs> you remember how we were all online back then? Mm -hmm. And that has not had um, as good a response as we had hoped that that would have. Uh, we switched, we tried uh, offering uh, monthly unit overview meetings after school where teachers could log in for 30 to 45 minutes and we would do an overview of the unit, tell them what was going on. And that also um, was not as effective as we would have liked to have seen it, but we did offer it, we did try that route. Uh, we have offered after school trainings as well. And it's just, it depends on what's going on. I think where we're targeting the teachers most effectively is through those coaches on campus offering the training during PLC time, during meeting with the teachers during their planning, being able to go into the classrooms and be there live and while it's happening. And so that's where we have found to be most effective. Got it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, overall, I guess, like if you were to think about, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, it sounds, this, this is a ton of change. Um, even in maybe even the last year, two years, ton of change for districts, um, but very positive impact for students. The three of you have also talked about it, there's a lot of progress that's been made, but you know there's there's there are still many needs, and I would we would love to hear you talk a bit about what are the needs that you see um, currently in bilingual education. What are the challenges that you're grappling with now or that you expect to be grappling with in the coming years? And how are you thinking about those? Um, so we'll start with you, Natalie, um, sorry, Betty. I think one of the things definitely that we've encountered as a big challenge is the resources. Um, as you know, we're shifting in curriculum and looking at all of our different content areas, finding the resource that's available in both languages is always one of the biggest challenges. And we have brought to the table that if it's not available in both languages, we will not move forward with it, right? Because we need to make sure that uh, there is equity that's at the forefront. And um, I think that until we start to see that shift in mindset and, and looking at equity through the lens of our multilingual learners, until we see that shift, then I think we will continue to struggle with the resources that we provide. But know that we, as a district, we are very dedicated. Our teachers are very dedicated. So I think that as we continue to work in collaboration, uh, we're able to supplement some of that, but I think it continues to be a definite challenge. Thank you. Um, Liliana. I think I will echo Betty. Resources is a key. We also struggle with currently redesigning our curriculum, especially in early literacy in both languages, English and Spanish. And it is it is hard because you want to find, we know each language has a unique way to teach and practices, but we want to launch with the resources because what our bilingual classrooms need the English part of the curriculum, right? And so we need to make sure we are aligned and we're providing what they need. I see one of the biggest challenges that we have to meet right now is resources with teachers, a short of teachers that they are certified to teach bilingual classrooms. And so one of the things that we have based with that is 
been able to train people that are becoming new to profession. So it's learning how to teach, but I'll only teach, but how do you teach in a bilingual classroom, right? Because it takes another level of training, another level of expertise, and being able to deliver the content to be fidelity with the language that you're teaching. But one of the things that we have also faced is the assessment piece. That's one of the biggest things. How do you report to parents in the community a true biliteracy student and how much the child knows in one language versus the other and how those bilingual reports come out with the cross-linguistic, right? Like you have a kid that is in a dual two-way program. How do you report that and serve that information? So I think being able to have the tools, the resources, and the teachers to make sure, and also one of the biggest things is also uh, training your leadership at the district level where they value what bilingual education is, right? Because if they don't, they don't understand that, you need the support of all your stakeholders to make that program, to really through validate it, to make it part of it. And so everyone is on board by changing and making those your uh, district and campus uh, goals as a district for education. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Esther. So everything that Liliana and Betty have said, like I agree with it completely. We're, we're facing those as well. Resources is huge. Having authentic literature in Spanish, um, having it age appropriate and user friendly and at the right reading levels, all of those things and just having enough of it. There are so many great programs out there that just exist in English. and. I'm telling you for everybody listening that if you were to start a program where you had curriculum and testing and resources all in one platform in Spanish, you would be rich. So for anyone wanting to start a business idea, um, but otherwise um, for us, you know, just some of our challenges are making sure that our students are growing from year to year on the TELPAS testing, on STAR testing, making sure that they are really making that progress and that it's reflected when they test. Um, and then another challenge that we face is really just unique to children and being um, a dual language speaker in America. Everything that you watch is in English. Everything that you listen to is in English. Your friends at school all speak English. And so our kids, they just like by, by upper elementary, they just want to speak English and they start losing that passion for Spanish. And so keeping kids connected to their original language, whether it's Spanish or Vietnamese or any of the other um, languages that are spoken, like just constantly reminding kids that you have a superpower because you speak two languages and you don't want to lose it. And it will open doors for you in the future. And keeping them excited about that and proud of, proud of that is really important so that they stick with it as they get older and they're not like, oh, this is too hard. I just want to do English. Um, and then uh, that need for equity that we've talked about, that's really, really important. Um, and then another thing that, another challenge that we've run into is that sometimes you have teachers who are certified bilingual teachers, but their Spanish is not as high as their English. And so that creates a challenge when they're trying to teach in those upper grade levels. And I, I, I'll be the first to say, I'm a heritage speaker. I grew up in the States. I went to school in the States. I did not go to school in a South American country. And so my vocabulary in Spanish is not going to be the same as a native Spanish speaker. Um, I grew up speaking Spanish first, but I've been in America the whole time, right? And so there's teachers that struggle with that where they don't have that level of Spanish that's really going to help the kids develop the level of Spanish that they need. Um, I do wanna give a shout out to a resource that we got this year that was the M Class Lectura. All the way through fifth grade, we've been using it. We love it. It really helps us get into that science of reading in Spanish. And that's a big need is developing more and more resources aligned to the science of reading in Spanish because we do learn to read differently in Spanish, but we still want to follow the science. And so that is the last resource I'll list that is a challenge that we're hoping to um, find solutions to as time passes. Thank you for sharing that. And those are all such important challenges and just all over the spectrum of challenges from leadership to resources to, um, to, to staffing. And it's heartbreaking, you know, hearing about hearing that children don't want to embrace their, um, their native language and do start to lose it. And so that, that is so important. 
Um, we have a few minutes to take questions from, from our group. And so I'm going to take a quick look at the, at the Q and A and thank you for your questions. I hope we'll try to get, um, to, to many of them. There was a question that I saw earlier on about strands, whether you have multiple strands of, um, of, uh, whether you have whole school models or strand models in your school. And I guess while answering that, there was a kind of sort of a related question, but different um, is whether the models in this, whether the models in the school are lottery based um, or whether it's a zoned or, or a home school. So um, who just feel free to just raise your hand or just start talking amongst the panelists who would wanna share how that, how that works in their district. I can say that on our district, sometimes we do have a, a zones or specific um, demographics within our city that they want to be in the dual two-way program, which is mean English speaking students come in to be on in a classroom where Spanish speaker students are learning. And sometimes it is a challenge. Just like we said before, we have a limited resources and we have limited places to seats and because to be uh compliance with our state and the norms you cannot have a classroom which has to be equally even and so therefore that's where it's a limit number of students that you can accept into the program so they do go into first come first service and then eventually if there's too many then go into an awaiting list we put all in there and then it is a lottery system so pretty much we have to uh pick up because we cannot serve all the students. However, if the student is not zoned to that particular campus where the campus is on their school zone, we will uh, offer that they can be transferred to another campus on our schools where they could go and get the services and get being enrolled on their program. So yes, we do have some kind of systems to support and be as provide the program as broad as an abilities are, whether we have the resources and the capacity to hold the program. Thank you. Anything to add, Betty or Esther? No, I think ours is very similar to Liliana's. Um, we offer our one-way program district-wide, but our two-way program is only offered at uh, six of our campuses, meaning that any parent that is interested has to be within the zone. Otherwise, if there, uh, if there is availability, they can go on a waiting list. Uh, but then again, it's, it's first come first serve. So parents do attend like a parent forum. They do register to be part of the program and, um, and it's based on availability. And ours is ours is similar. So same idea. Got it. Um, there is a, you know, we've talked some about other languages and there's a there's an interesting question here that I um, would love your perspective on, especially since you have um, all done work for um, in PD or certification for um, for English learners for, for, for the teachers. Um, how important is it for English speaking educators to have an understanding of non alphabetic orthographies used by students and so where you've you know got many of these other languages, particularly Asian languages. Um, love to hear more about that. I think one of the main things, and actually we had a meeting yesterday to teaching, uh, we're working on an early literacy curriculum and how important it is to teach at the are at the district level and the teachers are ESL certified, but the purpose of, especially when you're teaching them how to read, directionality. One of the biggest pieces is we're looking at our protocols and um, rubrics as you go into the classrooms. And one of the big ones yesterday, Bob, it was directionality and explicitly because of the reason, because some of those languages are read uh, right to left versus left to right. And then even the able or like the science of reading when you're teaching the phonemes to the students, like teaching them the correct way, being able to expose them to the language and to the alphabet principle, right? Because we know that they are not. And so what they have, we're looking into our rubrics and curriculum to be explicit and systematic to address the needs of our multilingual learners that they speak a completely different language. Thank you for sharing that. I um, 
was just really excited to hear so much of everything you were saying. I was not watching the, the clock um, with one minute left. Um, I'm going to just turn it over to, to our team, to Lauren, to see if there's any, any final wrap up we want to share. Thank, and I want to, before, before I turn it over to her, I just really want to say like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panel. You have so much expertise um, to, to offer and so much, I, and really just thank you for coming here and for all the work that you're doing with students and, and for other educators. Um, Lauren. Thank you so much, Kajal. And I just want to echo what Kajal said. Um, we really appreciate your time today, Esther, Liliana, and Betty. We really appreciate all of the invaluable, um, insight you gave to all of our attendees today and those that will be watching it at a later date. And Kajal, thank you so much for, um, navigating our panel today. Um, just to wrap up before we jump off, um, you will get a link to the recording of this as well as the certificate of attendance. And I also want to reinforce that we do have some upcoming webinars um, coming up before the series ends. And we encourage you to join us for one of these upcoming events, as well as to check out the past webinars that are available on demand. So we'll drop that link in the chat, or I just saw my colleague actually drop the link in the chat already. Thank you, Victoria. Um, so we invite you to join us, join us again. Thanks so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.